Hello everyone, and welcome to my show, my very, uh, uh, slow uploading schedule, not very steady show. Anyway, um, today I'm going to be talking about Console Wars by Blake J. Harris. Now, um, <clears throat> if you're looking at the, notice the two, uh, uh, controllers. One is the classic Super Nintendo. The other is Sega Genesis. So, and for those of you who don't know, Sega wasn't always just some third-party uh, developer. In fact, they were like one of the big. Uh, the fact during like the early to early to mid '90s or whatever, they were like one of the big top dogs in the video game industry. And uh, <clears throat> they were basically one of the. Uh, two big competitors and the big console wars between, of course, Sega and Nintendo. And this whole here thing here centers mainly around uh, the uh, around uh, Tom Kalinske, as he was hired by Sega to help them, uh, you know, essentially brand the Sega Genesis deal and and brand, uh, and you know get people to buy it and you know and make it essentially try and make it into the success it is or it has become and um, you know it has different ideas ranging from uh, that we are covering in here from the uh, you know how he believed in razor blade economics where the majority of the or like a lot of the money is not necessarily in the you know the handle or whatever but rather in the blades so in this case, he applied it to this, and um, <clears throat> by like selling the Sega Genesis at like the minimum price, and having S Sonic be the you know cons be the game that would be sold with it, you know, and you know just relying on uh, the big uh, gaming the of uh, of like people to like buy uh, with uh, like extra games, and that's how they make their money, and you know. You know, to um, the whole uh, <clears throat> implementing of uh, Sonic Tuesday and coming up with that whole idea, to going to third-party developers and being more friendly to them because, um, yeah, while we do owe the uh, Nintendo a lot for essentially, sing not for lack of a better phrase, almost single-handedly pulling us out of the, the video game crash. And you know, um, there are still plenty of uh, practices that could be seen as monopolistic, you know, ranging from only being able to l allow third-party developers to have like a certain number of uh, video games per year be published. And um, yeah, <laughs> and, um, although this whole thing isn't just from Sega's perspective, there's also stuff from Nintendo, you know, as they would. Uh, as you know with their history going all the way back to 1890 something as a card game <clears throat> you know and how they would like get contracts at uh, selling cards the card decks to like I think, casinos or whatever and eventually going all the way into the 20th century and you know their history with the arcade games and whatnot and uh, a sort of a uh, <clears throat> with the stuff like Donkey Kong and having like this whole courtroom drama between them and uh, Universal Studios over King Kong and Donkey Kong, you know, um, and different, you know, things looking at it from each side, you know, Sega looking at uh, their uh, Sonic character as a, uh, and branding it as specifically as a Mario killer, kind of explains how Mario, how, Sonic kick, kick Mario's ass at a death battle, considering it was made specifically to kill Mario. To the people at Nintendo seeing uh, Sonic as nothing more than a just a stupid Mario knockoff, and Sega as little more than a one-hit wonder program, wonder, wonder, you know, company that just sort of got hit lucky with one, uh, you know, one franchise, and just although with. Um, with I uh, when I uh, look at it, Sega now, it does kind of seem like that, you know. I mean, do you, when you think of Sega, you know, now do you think of 
Fantasy Star or Streets of Rage, or did you just go straight to Sonic? So, but even so, uh, you know, uh, so there's also plenty of uh, <clears throat> stuff like how uh, apparently Kalinsky was having like difficulty work with like, or not difficult, but there's like, seems like there's, it's kind of seemed like there's a bit of antagonism between, you know, Sega of America and Sega of Japan and, you know, trying to figure out how stuff works, is going to work between them, and, um, but yeah, there's, like, <clears throat> so many interesting stuff here. Now, I'm kind of having a hard time believing some of the stuff is actually true, but, um, <clears throat> you know, especially as, um, like how they interrupted him, like, in the middle of a sp spokesperson or whatever from Sega, like, approached Mr. Kalinsky, like, in the middle of his vacation or whatever, but, um, yeah, it gets into quite a bit of interesting stuff, you know, the uh, brief history of Nintendo, uh, brief history lo looking behind, um, or of his, a brief personal history of, uh, Tom Kalinsky as he, he was working with, like, Mattel and, uh, you know, and eventually wound up going into Sega. And just overall, it's an interesting book, and it's an interesting read, and even if you're not a gamer, I'd still think you'd think it was uh, kind of interesting looking at, uh, you know, the whole business thing from, like, behind the scenes. And, again, especially if you're a gamer, then I think you'd be very interested in the whole history of games, you know? So, yeah. My overall personal comfort level recommendation with this is a 4 out of 5. You know, it's, um, no recommended. And especially for gamers, and even if you're not a gamer, like I said, I still think you'd find this an interesting read. And, uh, just check it out. Um, anyway, um, next time, we're going to be taking a look at some classics by... Isaac Asimov. Until then, see you later. And keep yourselves awesome by going out and checking out uh, supporting your local bookstores, libraries with your patronage, money, whatever. And have a good day. <laughs>